Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Hello folks, welcome back to World War II TV and we are continuing our look at Pearl Harbor and this time we are looking at the role of the military nurses and the hospitals and the whole medical side of things and it's interesting that this follows the show last night when we talked about the films because one of the, if you haven't seen it, go back and check the link and with me and the two guys from Fighting on Film discussed the films is that one thing we thought was really good about the Michael Bay Pearl Harbor was the strong portrayal of the female characters and Kate Beckinsale getting in. Whether Sure, some of the authenticity was a bit wrong with what they were doing, but the fact there were strong characters doing that was really good because that's not always the case in war films. But anyway, today we are talking about this subject. My guest, Dr. Zaina Bizri, is a historian. She has studied and talks about and writes about and lectures about the role of women in World War II. So we have the right experts to deal with this subject. So good morning to you. Good evening to me, Zaina. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you, Paul? I'm pretty good. So, um, yeah, I hope you heard what I just said there about the, about mm -hmm. the nurses and what have you. And it is an interesting thing that that probably for a lot of people, that movie did push forward the idea that there were women at Pearl Harbor and that women were directly involved in those events, big events. And it's, you know, regardless of the fact there's a lot about that movie to not like, and we don't want to go down that path. We did that yesterday. That it must have been kind of a positive thing for people. You know, 20 years ago, there'd have been a lot of veterans of the nursing corps in various countries who might have seen that. And I'm sure they would have been a bit pleased that, that they were given a bit of a, a, a crack of the whip there and a, given some attention. What, what's your feeling about it? Uh, I think that that's the saving grace of that movie yeah. uh, is, is how well they portrayed uh, women. Um, I, I think that the, the story of women in World War II does continue to get erased because it is kind of off the front lines. It's in hospitals and it's not something that we think about. And we're so inundated with the Rosie the Riveters and all of the women who went into the workforce and all of the home front things, which were also uh, an incredible change um, just because of the scale that we were working on. Um, that we kind of overlook the fact that women, specifically nurses, were part of the military starting at the turn of the 20th century. Um, so I, I, that was the thing that I really appreciated uh, about that movie. Um, and just a quick note on movies, I think in the last 15 years, one of the best portrayals of women in the military in World War II is actually Captain America, the first Avenger. Um, okay. They get the uniforms right. <laughs> they get the, the the jobs right. They get the rankings right. Like it's it's correct, and it's. I was just I'm constantly amazed that I come out of there. It's a comic book movie, yeah. and it's the best representation of what these military women were doing during World War II. So that yeah, is a topic I'm, that for another day, though. <laughs> well, indeed, but I mean, but the the point is, and I was just saying before we went live, folks, is that you know I do my little bit of research I do before the shows and. The images we have, the accounts we have written at the time, they're 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 very a bit nice, a bit twee, a bit of their time. And you know, we haven't got the historiography of studies of women in World War II to draw on than we have if we take a campaign like I don't know Iwo Jima or Battle of Britain. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of accounts written over eight decades to give us an idea of how people were written about then, how they're being written about now, how we've come to understand the battles. But with the women in World War II, of course, there are some books, but there are a lot less of them. And so the ones written at the time are are of the time uh, in some ways. So, you know, how difficult is it to kind of wade through the, the information that there is, which isn't very much, and kind of present it in a modern way in 2021? You teach online, you teach this kind of thing. How is it, how difficult is it to find kind of modern representations with the materials that are available well it's it's some of it's hard the secondary stuff uh stuff written by historians uh that that's it's a really new field uh the the book that we all start from was published in 1986 um and there was some work done in the 90s that was really good and we've been grounding it but as far as looking at the gendered implications uh of this change that starts in the 90s um, I, I know probably personally 
about two thirds of the people who work on this uh, gender in the military. It's such a small community of historians. On the one hand, it's great. I can actually read everything on my topic. On the other hand, I, oof, um, for my last project, it's uh, in reviews right now um, with the publisher, uh, selling her the military, and it's about recruiting advertisements for women to get them into the uh, our, uh, military auxiliaries uh, in the U.S. And I had to invent a historiography um, because there's mil there's recruiting history, there's women in the military, there's advertising history. Nobody had put it all together, um, so it's it, it's it's both exciting and stressful because I can't um, work with other people and kind of find a new way of looking at it. I am, I'm actually creating the roadmap. Yeah. So it's, I will say this, there, um, there are some uh, up and coming scholars, uh, some grad students, and there are some scholars who are in tenured positions and who have a, a good history, uh, a good uh, track record in this uh, field. Uh, there just aren't a lot of us. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, you know, as, as we always say on World War II TV, I mean, my audience is predominantly male. It's predominantly middle-aged, uh, white, uh, kind of probably middle class. And that's a lot of a lot of World War II history is aimed at that demographic because they are the ones who, who they appear or they think are out there buying the books. The reality is, if you look on Twitter, there's an awful lot of people from outside of that demographic buying books um, and finding interest in World War II, but maybe not quite from the angle they want to go. But anyway, we're, we're in danger of just talking about historiography, but that's, I love, I love the subject, but here we are, we're talking about the, the military nurses at Pearl Harbor. So um, I'm going to hand over to you to start talking and I will jump in with questions and folks, if you have questions for us, please fire away comments about positive portrayals of women in world war II, anything like that, that is to do with this subject, put them up and we'll put them up on screen, but uh, over to you and we'll, we'll hear about what the, the important role they did. Okay. All right. So tiny bit of context. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there were women in the uh, army with the nursing corps uh, from the beginning of the 20th century. The army nurse corps is established in 1901 and the navy nurse corps in 1908. Uh, although women had been performing kind of ad hoc nursing prior to this, uh, most famously Clara Barton and the Red Cross during the Civil War, um, it was not structured. With the creation of the cores, we get structure for these women. Um, and it starts looking at uh, women who have professor professional certifications. Um, this is around the time that nursing in the civilian world is becoming a profession. Mm -hmm. And we see by the time we get to like 1915, 1920, not only is nursing a respectable profession, military nursing is becoming a respectable profession. Now, when we get to military nursing, uh, there is a really interesting uh, twist on this because the military is so heavily masculine, because especially at the turn of the 20th century, it is a thing that men do to become men. And if you are, you know, uh, a weak stripling or a young lad looking to kind of make your way in the world, uh, you go into the military to become a man. That's your your gendered social ritual. That's your ritual that you go through to achieve your manhood. But we don't do that as women. Women have to preserve and they don't go through anything strenuous. So we've got this weird kind of conflict going on. The way the nursing corps deal with it is they recognize that they are recruiting who you would, people you would call adventuresses. Uh, women who are looking to do something different. Like I could go nurse uh, and work in the local hospital. I could go into geriatrics. I could move to another part of the country, or I could sign up for the military and go serve in Hawaii. Um, and yeah, here is uh, one of the pre-war uh, recruiting posters. This one came out uh, mid-42. And uh, it was, yeah, it was shortly after Pearl Harbor that they put this together and they didn't really want to get into kind of what actually happened. Um, but yeah, they are emphasizing kind of the clean uniform and the sharp look. Um, women who signed up for uh, the nursing corps to try and get these exotic billets, um, they understood that the desirable locations were Manila Bay and Hawaii. Um, and I am going to bring in Manila uh, a awesome. bit on this Pearl Harbor discussion because those attacks did happen concurrently. Um, but a lot of the primary source uh, interviews with a lot of these nurses, they said, you know, you were told to pack ball gowns 
um, and and evening clothes because there were so few women on base that these women were in high demand as dates for officers to military balls, to just dinner parties. Um, one of the things that they would ask is, do you know how to play cards? <laughs> like, can you be a pair for bridge? Like things like that. Like they, there was this real social aspect to it um, that a lot of the women really enjoyed. Um, they pack your swimsuit, pack your evening gown, because I'm going to go serve in the hospital in Manila where most of my patients are officers wives. Uh, in 1940. So it was a, a real prime assignment. Um, when we get to the actual attacks, um, the surprise of the attack is what is uh, most striking out of the women's uh, stories. Um, obviously. <laughs> it's yeah, a very yeah, yeah. clear statement. But um, so I'm, I'm not actually not going to bring up Dutch Harbor just yet. There wasn't really a significant number of nurses at Dutch uh, at the time of the attack, but there were again in Manila and in Pearl. And in both cases, uh, they had to immediately switch from maternity care, working for, with uh, people who had met with misadventure. Someone gets injured doing their work and it's a minor injury. Someone has pneumonia, things like that. You know, standard, it's it's basically working like a civilian hospital and they had to switch on a dime to work on trauma care, burn care, dealing with chemical injuries, things like that. Um, the Pearl Harbor attack at 8 a.m. on Sunday happened at shift change, uh, which is another wrinkle. Yeah. There are uh, a few stories of uh, women who were walking to the hospital. They lived close enough. They didn't need a bus or anything like that. And they're walking. And they talk about they notice that there were a lot of planes in the sky. It's kind of noisy. And then they start hearing explosions and the siren goes off. And uh, the one that I remember most uh, is uh, the siren went off. She started running, got to the hospital and then couldn't really give a, a clear kind of timeline of what happened is that she got to the hospital as the first casualties were arriving um, and was so inundated with casualties that she actually really couldn't tell you what else happened because it was just a constant flow of wounded coming in. Um, there is, <coughs> oh, excuse me. No worries. Mm -hmm. well, I've got, uh, it gives me a time to ask you a question because yeah. one of the things I find really fascinating is, is that we have to look at the whole period through the lens of what it was like in the early 40s, not what it's like now in 2021. And, you know, the lot of men joining the services, they're going to be in America from religious backgrounds. They're probably not undressed in front of other men, let alone in front of other women, all those kind of things like that. And, I'm, you know, we could talk and maybe you will talk about the protocols of, of, of who can be uh, allowed with whom. Um, I mean, I know there's some comments about the Pearl Harbor film that, the, you know, the Dory Miller, the black cook would not be allowed to be alone with a female officer nurse and things like that but obviously when something like pearl harbor happens or manila or any of these things there that kind of protocol of the rules of who can go in what in what departments and wards and it all goes out the window because there's an emergency going on but how difficult were those protocols i mean obviously you're teaching people to be nursing to be a nurse but just how to work as a nurse within an environment that is male mostly male that has all these rules in place you know training them to to know what to do and the protocols must have been almost as lengthy as the actual the nursing side of it so can you have you got any sort of information on that yeah well what's interesting is that um first you have to start with nursing school uh and one of the things that you had because the army nurse corps and navy nurse corps only took graduated nurses with the certifications right. and part of the process of nursing school is getting you over that hump um even today it's a lot of okay you are going to see gruesome things and you're going to see you're going to see naked body parts of <laughs> that you may not have seen before yeah. and you're going to have to continue to be professional about it so that is 100% part of the protocol and of the education right. that the women are getting. The interesting social protocol is actually the racial protocol. Yeah. And you brought up Dory Miller and the other black mess men. And there were a lot of black mess men and a lot of black uh, uh, sailors aboard these ships and working at Pearl who were a part of um, the attack and who were injured and needed to be treated. Um, in the cases of during the attack, they were just kind of sh shoved into the ward and they just went through triage like everyone else. Yeah. 
And as you said, the protocols go out the window. Once we get past the initial emergency, once the, the, all the waves have gone away and we realize that they're not coming back, uh, we start to see that they start segregating the wards. And yeah, they do have um, a setup of multiple nurses at one time, or they go in with a male escort into the black wards. That all comes back immediately. Um, I want to say probably by the next day, uh, once wow. they're through the triage, they're, they're starting to separate them out. Uh, yeah, uh, the racial segregation um, was absolutely crippling to the military during World War II. One of the problems that they have is they start almost immediately enlisting more African-American men and other men of color into uh, the U.S. Army. And because of these racist rules about who can treat whom, they have a lack of nurses. And they don't want to accept nurses into the Navy Nurse Corps. There was a letter sent in to the Navy Nurse Corps uh, in the spring of 1941 from uh, a representative of a graduate class of African-American nurses. They were, about, they were gonna graduate by the end of the year. At this point, they knew war was coming and they said, hey, we know you have black men in the Navy. We know that you're gonna need nurses. Where do we sign up? We can't find the information. And they were, the reply from headquarters was, we don't have a need for black nurses. And then a year later, they were desperately scrambling to find black nurses um, to fill these roles. And of course, once they bring in the nurses, they're not putting them in combat hospitals. They're putting them in segregated hospitals uh, uh, on segregated bases, and they're shipping the wounded from where they are injured to these segregated hospitals uh, and basically shoving them off to the side, um, which is its own problem because there are certain injuries that you shouldn't move that quickly after an injury. You should let them heal, but they're just shipping them out to keep those hospitals segregated. As a result, once the, the Army Nurse Corps starts taking African-American nurses well before the Navy Nurse Corps does, and they have to start building separate barracks and separate facilities and all of that because they are still segregated. It is, it's a huge mess. And if they had just said, we're throwing out the segregation rules at the start of the war um, and just left it that way, they would have saved money, time, a lot, and a lot, a lot of pain and suffering for a lot of soldiers and sailors who were injured and, ha and had to suffer a lack of care because they didn't want to let white nurses treat black men. Wow. I mean, and that, you know, that's a whole subject. We could go down that whole rabbit hole and it would be a worthy discussion, but there's only so much we can do. But it seems that every time we're talking about any of the countries in the early stages of World War II, everybody is going through a massive great learning curve because of being unprepared for the scale of how World War II is going to hit them. So Britain is, is cranking up everything, Russia, uh, the USA, Canada. And in those early years, the programs could have been moving faster if there were people there with a bit more foresight of what will be needed in a year and two years time. And, and, you know, we can see now there's a bit of kind of heel dragging at this point there that is slowing things down. But in general terms, where would you say, you know, n n nursing is in the American military at the outbreak of World War II? Is it kind of advanced? Is it lagging behind? Are there kind of pioneers in it? Has it got good kind of ambassadors for it within the branch who are seeing it as a good thing kind of if we compare it to like the modernity of battleships or uh, or aircraft wh where does nursing sit if that's not a weird question to our answer not a weird question at all uh it's it's complicated though because medically they are right at they're at the tip right. of the spear they are cutting edge uh, because they've got so many new kinds of injuries to deal with. Um, and they're also having to learn how to do this with nursing so shortages and in combat hospitals. You know, once we get to uh, the D-Day invasion, um, nurses are in field hospitals that are in the combat zone. Um, so by the way, this does debunk the myth that women don't go to combat zones. Field hospitals are in the combat zone and there are nurses there and they've got to learn how to perform their duties while they're being shelled. Um, so yeah, the, the practice is incredibly advanced. Socially, not so much. Uh, the nurses <laughs> have to be kept separate um, from the men uh, because a lot of men don't perceive them as professionals. Uh, they perceive them as uh, sexual partners. 
This is a thing that also happens to uh, the Women's Army Corps women, the WACs, who go overseas as well. And just on bases in the U.S., they are they have to be kept separated from the men because the men do try to get into their compounds, especially in uh, combat areas. They have MPs outside of the women's areas and the nurses' areas uh, to prevent American soldiers from getting in to trying to get to the nurses. Um, yeah. Right. Uh, within the military, uh, nurses have are part of have a separate command structure at the start of the war. They don't get the same rank. They get something called relative rank, which is just an awful euphemism because the problem that they're running into is that nurses have essentially college degrees um, and they are far more educated than all of the enlisted that they are uh, in command of, but they are women and the enlisted men don't like that. Um, There's also the problem that we're running into is that uh, because Nursing is so heavily gendered. The Army and Navy Nurse Corps do not accept men who are nurses. And a lot of these men who have gone through nursing school and have the certifications are put into the medical corps and work as orderlies, which is a demotion, and it's not using their full training. And they really resent, especially some of them who have several years' experience as nurses, they really resent being under the command of a fresh graduate just because she's a woman. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because because of this idea of only women are nurses. So these men cannot be nurses and cannot be part of the nursing corps. They've got to be orderlies causes a lot of resentment. Nurses don't get the same pay. They don't get comparable pay for that relative rank. Um, They're when they're in charge, uh, they say that the head nurse has the equivalent rank of a captain, but she's not getting captain's pay. And it's one of the major problems that they have to sort out that they have to actually start paying the women more. It's a bigger problem. Pay is a big problem in the Army Nurse Corps. It's less of a problem in the Navy Nurse Corps. The Navy's better about paying their women what the men are making just kind of across the board during World War II. Uh, the Army, they have to they, they have to go to Congress <laughs> to get that uh, sorted out um, and sort out the relative rank. They don't sort out relative rank until 1944, 45. Um, and they, so the nurses are getting paid less than what they would be earning in a civilian hospital. Uh, for the duration of the war. Wow. So, yeah. yeah it, it, I mean, yeah, there, and there's so many topic lines and questions I can answer, but ask, but, um, you know, we've got images of posters and things there. So let's talk about recruiting. I mean, you said there that the, the nurses coming in, they're, they're, you know, they're college educated, they're, they're professional, they're middle class and upper class. What sort of people was it drawing and how were they selling them the idea? Because I know this is what you're writing about because mm-hmm. recruiting is – even a lot of money even today goes in with how they recruit within the military what sort of people you're looking for what are you wanting to do and you look at the campaigns for example the british army has run over the last 40 years it's it's kind of it changes dramatically through the 70s 80s 90s and who they're looking for so going back to this kind of the, the 40 41 42 era um did did we was the way they recruited constant or did they adapt as things move on what were they looking for who were they getting were they getting too many not enough run us through the kind of a recruiting story if you wouldn't mind no worries so yeah um they did definitely have to change um the one that we've got up on screen this is also uh, this is from actually 1940 um this is a pre-war look at this awesome uniform you're going to have all these adventures um and they continue to use it up until about 1942 Um, One of the things that happened uh, on the attack on Pearl Harbor or the attack on Manila was that uh, the nurses there didn't want to leave their patients and were evacuated to Corregidor when uh, Bataan fell. And by the time Corregidor fell to the Japanese, there were still nurses there and they were among the first POWs of World War II. They were liberated in 43 and immediately were put on war bond tours and recruiting tours. Um, and get, they were given fresh uniforms and trotted out as like, look at the heroism of these nurses. Because before the war, they talk about the the angel of the battlefield from the Civil War, or they talk about how nursing is this great profession and you get an education and you get a skill that you can use for the rest of your life. And early on in the war, we talk, it's the same thing that we're seeing for men, patriotism, let's defend ourselves, the, we need people with education in these certain roles, we need people to fill these roles. That stays stays very similar, but by 1943, that's when it starts to change, and that's when they realize uh, that they have to advertise to women as women Mm. uh, rather than as extensions of men. 
Um, and I didn't include them in the PowerPoint, but there are several uh, early nursing posters where it's it's largely about the men. I think if you go forward a couple, um, the next one, I think. Yeah, this one here. Uh, this is, by the way, the most must you're going to see any woman in a poster, in a recruiting poster uh, from 41 to 44. Uh, they do not show women getting dirty. Um, but this poster is designed to play on the fact that She's trying to help a man. You can see the um, the medical uh, bottle behind her, yeah. and she's asking for help. And it is help me take care of these men. And this is the exemplar of a lot of these posters and these advertisements and the radio ads and all of it, where it says, "We have so many wounded. We need to help them. Um, so please help me help them." And it's appealing to women's nurturing side. Um, but there's a whole series um, from 1944 onward where they don't put a woman on the poster. They put a wounded man on a poster and he talks about how the nurse helped him. Right. And that starts appealing to them as professionals. It says mm. she knew exactly what she was doing. She wasn't scared. She was, she was totally calm. She knew exactly how to treat my injuries. She comes back every day and she helps me with the things that I need help doing. There's a guy who's got uh, two broken arms. She helps me with, she helps me feed me and things like that. There's another guy who's got burns and she takes care of my burns. Um, and it's all about the professionalism that these women have. Uh, and once they start doing that, we start seeing uh, kind of less panic on board among recruiters that we don't have enough nurses. Um, once they say we're going to respect your professional ability, that's when we start seeing the, the pressure kind of come off of the need for nurses. They are still desperately understaffed by the end of the war. Um, they create the Cadet Nurse Corps in 1943. Uh, to entice high school girls to pledge to go to nursing school. And then when they go to nursing school, once they graduate, to join the military. And they're basically getting the military training while they're still in high school and in nursing school. And then they can just pop right into a hospital company as soon as they graduate and they don't have to go through boot camp. Um, and it's a benefit for both of them because, you know, the, <laughs> the girls get to do it all at once. And the military gets freshly trained nurses right off the bat. Um, and it worked really, really well. And they got a lot of young girls uh, as young as 15 joining uh, the Cadet Nurse Corps. And it was one of their most successful campaigns um, because it was, you will, it was talking about not only are you going to be a hero, are you you're going to do your bit? This is something that you can do now before you turn the minimum age for joining the other core minimum age, the youngest was 20 for women to join the women's auxiliaries. So you can join 15, 16 years old and say, you can pledge to join the core, pledge to go to nursing school, and then you join the military. Um, so it, it gives them that possibility more than just going to the USO, more than writing letters, you can actually do something concrete. And then you get an education because this war is gonna end someday and you can use this to have a career after the war is over. Putting that all together, that was, yeah, their most successful recruiting campaign in 1944. Wow. I mean, lot, lot, lots to unpack with all this. And <laughs> when I had Tessa Dunlop on recently talking about the ATS in the UK, and we talked about recruiting and posters and the jobs and things like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, all recruiting posters, whether you're male or female, they're not, they're presenting one aspect of army life. Men, it's mm -hmm. marching up and down a parade ground. They don't show them sort of digging fox souls and they're sitting in your own shit for a week. They don't kind of do that aspect of it. So all, all, all recruiting posters are, are slightly false advertising in that sense. But given that we're talking about Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor, again, the people watching this, I don't want to keep bringing up the movie, but we, we know what nurses were doing at Pearl Harbor. When post that event, we, we know that, you know, President Roosevelt goes and makes the, the day of infamy speech. We know the images that are there. What was the what was the PR aspect for the nursing? Did did the public get to hear what the nurses were doing there? Was it was it kind of hushed up? Was it you know because because they were doing really pretty amazing stuff there? The recruiting posters are all sort of people with their nice pressed uniforms and sort of going along wards, giving people jugs of water and plumping cushions is the kind of aspect you kind of get. But clearly they were doing more of that. But did the did the public get to hear that? Were there were there nursing heroes that were made a fuss of in the press alongside the kind of the, the male heroes, or was it sort of not really talked about? Uh, in the immediate aftermath, uh, so up till about midsummer 42, uh, no. Um, 
it was mostly talking about the men and it was ramping up the recruiting effort for getting men into the military. June 1942 and July 1942 is when we start seeing the creation of the Women's Army Corps, when we start seeing movement towards the creation of the waves and this kind of recognition that we need women. We need to put women into uh, the military in a lot of different um uh, roles, a lot of different uh, capabilities. And the one regarding nurses is they started talking about education. Um, women who have education, if you have a nursing degree, please join the Army Nursing Corps. Um, these two posters that you've just put up, these are post-war, or not post-war, po post Pearl Harbor, kind of 44. These are in 44. Uh, the women who are looking at art are, I believe they are in Paris. And the women with the water buffalo are in China. And it's basically saying it's still kind of playing on that exotic location kind of a thing. Um, but it's saying you can go out and do all of these things. This is kind of the most extreme. I don't think I, I showed you anything where they're actually doing the work yeah. of uh, nursing. There is one with it's, a, it's um, flight nursing. Flight nursing becomes a thing in 1944. Um, and they show the nurses kind of standing over very bandaged men kind of wrapped in blankets kind of holding a thing and like not actually doing anything like implying that there is medical treatment happening as far as hero nurses uh the first group of hero nurses are those nurses from manila uh the ones who are captured and have to survive in the japanese prisoner of war camps uh for a couple of years um once the Japanese figure out uh, that they are nurses, they do actually start uh, letting them treat the uh, sick and wounded who are in the hospital, in the prisoner of war camp, in the in the camp hospital. So they are, as prisoners, still working as nurses uh, for the military men that they are uh, being held with. Um, and there are a lot of, you know, pretty powerful stories of women, uh, some of these nurses kind of... Uh, slipping extra rations to the men who are injured and kind of going without and sharing their food and sharing their water and sharing access because the men as captured soldiers aren't considered worthy by the Japanese, but the women kind of hit this kind of liminal space for the Japanese. So sometimes they get fed and sometimes they don't. Uh, so when they have extra, they, they do uh, kind of share it out among the, the injured and the wounded. Um, and then once they're liberated, those stories start being told. Um, we don't but, but told if I may say so in a slightly sanitized way. When I had Dr. Carl James on a few mm -hmm. months ago now talking about the Australian nurses, uh, this was this was New Guinea. Um, mm -hmm. and without going into gory details, you know, they were raped. You know, that there, there was some nasty stuff there. But when they went back on a similar kind of thing, they went back on an Australian product of war bonds, but it was the, the press account said about the tribulations they had faced and the enduring of of, of dark conditions. And it was all a language used that didn't actually talk about what was happening to these people and how difficult their experience was and how tragic it was. So, so even, even though they're in the war zones, I'm sure the language of the time was always downplaying the risks of being bombed, downplaying the risks of just dealing with living with lots of men and downplaying the potential risks of, of capture and, and death. But, um, I want to bring it up because I, I, the sidebar, I don't want this message, this question to go back too far up and then scroll back up. But Malcolm Kelly is a good question. How do we account for how quickly the nurses at Pearl Harbor responded to the attack and got right to work? Thinking Monica Conta and Ruth Erickson examples, was it great training? Um, so so go, this kind of leads on this idea of the, of the, they've been through, they are nurses, but the suddenness of Pearl Harbor responding in that immediate kind of, emergency sense where did that ability come from do you think uh part of it is training um if one of the things that they that you learn in nursing school is triage yeah. and how to react quickly to situations i mean even outside of a war in you know 1938 there could be a multiple motor vehicle accident there could be a train derailment there could be a fire and you get dozens of injuries in dozens of patients in and you've got to deal with it right there they do teach that the other thing at Pearl Harbor, again, is that it's happening at shift change. Right. Um, and we've got all of these women who are coming in fresh. And then we have nurses who are refusing to go off shift. Right. Um, so we do have uh, extra nurses at work in the hospitals. Some of them do go off shift uh, like as scheduled, but there are others who do stay on for a few extra hours. 
Um, and that's a thing that, that happens in hospitals today. You know, you get a, a mass casualty event right at shift change, and there are going to be some who stay a little bit longer to, to deal with all of these people coming in. So it's part of it is training, but yeah, part of it is really lucky timing for uh, the casualties at Pearl. Mm-hmm. And there is also the unquantifiable aspect. Um, I mean, we may as well ask where does heroism come from? Yeah. Um, these women are faced with an unprecedented situation, something that they're training uh, really didn't prepare them for. It may have prepared them for a, a boiler explosion aboard ship or a, a fuel dump exploding, but nothing on this scale. The fact that they are able to step up and and really respond well really speaks to their their character yeah. and to their strength of, of will that they are able to to kind of make these choices. And, and that's not to, to speak ill of the people who were not able to step up, but there's a reason why we only have a few stories of this kind of this great response, this quick response. It's because that speaks to their internal ability. But overall, the nurses uh, at Pearl Harbor uh, responded uh, quickly uh, with a lot of calm that is necessary in a situation like that. They didn't panic. Uh, for the most part. <laughs> um, and they they did their work, they triaged, they treated, and they kept going until the casualties stopped coming in. Yeah. Um, that is partly training, and that is partly uh, the fact that they had extra bodies because of shift change, and partly just because that is something that nurses are inclined to do. And I suppose when we're thinking about Pearl Harbor and, and that, that the horror of that day, the nurses are as much as anyone doing something that is actually their daily job, albeit on a massive level and with lots more pressure than normal, but it is their job. The poor guys on the Arizona who are below deck when that's rolling over, that's no amount of training for your normal job can prepare you for that situation. You are completely out of your normal zone. This is, as I say, their normal zone, but cranked up to another level, isn't it? So they, they are drawing on something they should be able to do, but you know, we talked at the beginning about the historiography and how the, you know, the accounts we have, are there good, strong accounts written by nurses at Pearl Harbor who say what they were doing on kind of minute by minute basis? Because we know, I know there's a lot more men in Pearl Harbor than there were women that day, but we know we could go and find hundreds of accounts of people on the airfields or on, on board the other ships or watching what's going on. What do we actually have from the nurses? And well, for basic question, how many nurses do you think were actually... Uh, working that day if you count the shift change there is it um but so how many and what how many accounts do we have i suppose is my questions so i don't know hard numbers um but i i estimates are about 50 percent of the nurses coming off shift stayed on uh um so they had about half again what they would normally have um I am more familiar with the hard numbers in Manila Bay. Right, okay, um, but, or, or, well, we can talk about that as well, but yeah. Yeah, uh, Manila Bay uh, actually had a pretty light contingent of nurses. Uh, they were probably working about 20% under staff on the day of the attack. Um, a lot of nurses did come in, come into the hospital when the attack happened uh, to deal with kind of the overflow. And then they also had the issue of pulling nurses out because they were trying to evacuate them. Um I believe the contingent was something uh, like about 200 something nurses uh, overall. And then by the time we get to the evacuation to Corregidor, there were, oh no, sorry, my numbers are off. We evacuated about 200 out of Bataan to Corregidor. So they had about 500 uh, before the attacks. And then it's, uh, I wanna say 49 uh, Navy nurses and a similar number, slightly fewer army nurses. Um, were captured. Um, So uh, a little over, uh, around 100 to 120 nurses were captured uh, in, off of Corregidor. Um, There were some that were captured in Bataan. Um, There were, and then there were um, a lot of nurses kind of in civilian hospitals that got put into uh, the prison of war camp. Uh, These women were not Filipino. They were not East Asian. They were white and they got kind of shoved in uh, into the prisoner of war camp. The final contingent that was rescued out of that camp was about 150 of uh, nurses from the U S army and Navy. And there were uh, Australians, uh, uh, Kiwis. And I think that there were some French and British who were also rescued. Um, but I would have to check that off. I, I'm not sure about that off the top of my head. Um, but I do know that there was a large Australian Anzac yeah. contingent, uh, in that camp 
with the women, with the American women. Um, Pearl Harbor, again, because it's, it's, it's closer to the U.S. and it also was not under enemy occupation. Uh, <laughs> they could keep on kind of pumping other uh, nurses, new nurses, into uh, the hospitals. So they were able to uh, kind of replenish as these nurses were getting burned out or reaching the end of their their time in, or they needed to be transferred to other places, or they just needed to increase the contingent. I think by the end of forty two, there was something like between 800 and 1,000 nurses in Hawaii uh, working in those uh, hospitals because that was kind of the first port of call yeah, yeah. Uh, for exactly. the injured coming off the hospital ships. They would be popped into the hospitals uh, there. And I did see something pop up real quick. Yes, there were U.S. Army nurses at Pearl. Uh, <laughs> there were U.S. Army nurses and U.S. Navy nurses both in Pearl and in Manila uh, because we had the Navy contingents and we had the National Guard contingents uh, in both places. Right, so my next question, we can go back to whatever you want to talk about, but my next question with regards to Pearl Harbor is, I think, when we think, again, movie imagery, novels, stories, the idea of medics in general is going beyond what they've been trained to do. Even the medics I knew who served in Normandy, so often they're going way beyond what they're supposed to be doing, and they're kind of 19-year-old kids performing heart surgery. With the, with the female nurses, as a rule, do you think they're generally sticking to what they can do and doing that well, obviously nudging a little bit over to stuff because, you know, th there's nursing and there's doctors and the overlap of what they can do. There is an overlap, but there are things only doctors can do. But, you know, are we getting the cases of, of, of female nurses doing things kind of essentially beyond their pay grade because there just aren't enough proper doctors there? Or do they kind of stick to their what they're knowing and just keeping people alive until the next level of care can come. What's your kind of take on that? So on the day of the attacks, uh, yeah. nurses are doing triage and they're just sorting out who is the most injured and they're doing uh, the full range of nursing care, but they're largely sticking within nursing care. Once we get into 42 and 43 uh, and we see that we've hit that nursing shortage, we've also hit a doctor shortage. Yeah. Uh, Doctors take even longer to make. <laughs> um, and it, it's not as good a career for doctors in the military as it is for nurses because of a lot of a lot of things, including the gendered expectations of what a, a man is going to do. Um, so we do see that there are a lot of cases where nurses are doing things that should be a doctor's job. The most common is uh, medication. Um, there are rules about who can dispense and who can... Um, and whatever. And we do see that a lot of nurses are like turning to a doctor and says he needs X, Y, and Z. And the doctor says, you're right, here you go. And, <laughs> and the nurse is off. Um, nurses are not necessarily like uh, doing surgery, but they are starting by the time we get to 43, there are stories of nurses putting in stitches in aid stations, um, just kind of quick stitch you back up, send you back out um, kind of thing. Uh, because there aren't, there's maybe two doctors at that aid station. And it's a larger contingent of nurses and orderlies, and they're doing a lot of things. The big leap up that we actually see in care is among the orderlies, um, and you have it up on screen, uh, the hospital company women. Yeah. Um, so these women uh, in the hospital companies, they're wax Women's Army Corps. They don't have any medical training. This is the only way for them to kind of get into medical training, to work, to help ease the shortage without having to go two years in nursing school. And they are supposed to be like the woman in the poster is just carrying a tray um, and they're supposed to be like cleaning and everything. They're like helping with moving patients. They're changing bandages. They're, they're not dispensing medication, but they are assisting in that. Like they're doing a lot more uh, than what they should be doing um, than what their job description is simply because of that shortage of trained people. Um, so yeah, we do. We do see a, uh, some nurses kind of, especially in aid stations, really kind of stepping up and doing kind of minor, thing, minor things. Um, but the real jump is for these women who are in uh, the Women's Army Corps, the hospital companies. Uh, and this gets us back to those men who have nursing degrees who are working as orderlies. There comes a point where those men are functionally nurses. Um, and they are doing the same nursing work that the women's or that the Navy or Army Nurse Corps uh, nurses are doing. Um, they're not getting paid for it. They're not getting credit for it. And they would probably get in trouble for doing it, but it's got to be done. And they're technically doing it under the supervision of their commanding officer who is a nurse. And that's kind of how they hand wave it away as it's, it's okay. 
Yeah, no, it's, it's all fascinating stuff. And I'm very grateful that the sidebar is very busy today with lots of people adding their own information and, and, and further discussions there, which is really good because, uh, but let's get back to the idea of, 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 of nursing generally and the changes in World War II, because this is the, you know, the, the, the core area of your research and the recruiting and how they're changing. Because someone asked earlier on, I can't go back and find the message because you have people who are career nurses and then people joining up as an interim thing because they're needed in the war, just like there are men joining up to become a pilot. They've got no interest in becoming a, staying a pilot or, or infantry, whatever it is. It's just needs must for the war. And then I'll go back to being something else. So does that change the way nursing uh, operates? No pun intended in that you get these people coming in who are seeing it as a patriotic duty at, rather than a career opportunity. Is there a kind of a conflict with how that works? Um, yeah, we do see a lot of women, uh, a lot of nurses joining the Army and Navy Nurse Corps uh, as when they're they're fully graduate nurses and they come out of civilian hospitals. Um, and this is one of the things that causes that nursing shortage is uh, they start actually advertising in early 43. If you're a nurse in a civilian hospital, stay put. We need you there. Um, and we're going to work through the Cadet Nurse Corps. We're going to work through the Red Cross to try and get freshly graduated nurses into the Army and Navy Nurse Corps. Um, but yeah, there's there's a real rush of women who are nurses going in and saying, I am a nurse. I can do this. I know you need these people. I know you need these positions filled. And there's a there isn't there isn't a recruiting push like we see with the Cadet Nurse Corps. There isn't a recruiting push like that for nurses um, in the first I would say a year after Pearl Harbor, uh, it picks up in early 43. Uh, the patriotic fervor after the attack on Pearl Harbor, as far as recruiting goes, uh, starts. it starts to dip in the summer and then it starts coming back up again um, as we get towards Thanksgiving and the one year anniversary and we're starting to see movement in North Africa and things like that. And we're starting to see movement in the Pacific as things are spreading out. Um, that's when we start seeing it coming back up again. Um, but as far as nurses go, uh, once we get to early 43, mid 43, there's a concern that we're going to have empty hospitals for civilians, um, uh, because all of the nurses are, because we've got this, such a huge gap in what we need and what we have, mm -hmm. um, that there's a real danger of, uh, civilian staffing collapsing. So we do see this kind of statement of, look, if civilian nursing is considered an essential war job, and just like men who work in heavy industry, these women are told to stay where you are because we need you there. Um, and that's one, another reason why they do push the Cadet Nurse Corps so hard, uh, because the women who are coming through the Cadet Nurse Corps when they graduate, and we get the first graduates in 1945, and they're kind of parceled out across most military hospitals, um, and this lets women who had joined just for the duration leave the service and go back to their civilian jobs. And that's kind of when we start seeing it balancing out a little bit. Um, yeah. I mean, I remember when I, I did a show in my, in my medics week, a few week, weeks in, and, and Lee Mandel, who was a U.S. Navy uh, doctor came on and we were talking, he was talking about the similar thing about the doctors in civilian life who have a multi range of tasks because they can deal with children and elderly people and cancer and the things that you're not dealing with in a military environment, they were best staying where they were because of that broad range of skills they had. And I guess the same applies to nursing because military nursing requires lots and lots of a, of a similar area of things. You're not going to be dealing with ear infections in two-year-olds in, in military nursing, although you might be in civilians, I suppose, in a, in a, in a, you might be in someone like Batana coming up there. But so does that mean that they then are involved evolving what they're looking for and how they're training people because of the specific needs? You know, we're going back to Pearl Harbor again. What happened in Pearl Harbor was sudden and shocking and puts a lot of pressure on everybody from, from aircraft carrier production to, to aircraft design to getting people in the military. So, so nursing, like everything else, would have had a big, you know, kick about we need to improve, we need to escalate, we need to adapt, we need to streamline. So when we talk about, we've got the post on image there, the, the Cadet Nurse Corps, that's presumably specifically designed to feed people in with the exact skills they need in military nursing. So again, we wouldn't need civilian nurses to move because we're taking them away from something they're good at. So, so explain a bit more about the kind of the, this particular um, program. 
Okay, so the Cadet Nurse Corps, it's exactly uh, what you're talking about because we do have civilian nurses who are in geriatrics or pediatrics that really not useful. Um, but all the trauma nurses, for sure, we do want people with trauma training in the military. Uh, so when these uh, high school girls sign up for the Cadet Nurse Corps, they uh, are directed towards nursing programs that will get them through quickly. And it's an ex sometimes they can do an accelerated program. They can you know go year round in some of these programs and get out uh, six months earlier and be in the military uh, that much sooner. And yeah, they are on trauma rotation. Uh, they do learn the general stuff because the point of this advert, and it's right here on the poster that we've got up, a lifetime education for free. And they're creating kind of transferable skills. And yes, they are producing a lot of nurses who are trauma specialists, um, but they are also producing psychiatric nurses uh, for mm -hmm. men with psychological injuries. And that translates very, very well. Long-term care for people who are hard. Um, and they do start developing, again, flight nursing is a thing that they learn in the, in the Army Nurse Corps uh, and Navy Nurse Corps, but that is a possibility that they can get into. And these are all kind of options that these uh, young women get when they start their nursing school program. Um, because it is nursing school and they are gonna be fully certified nurses, they do get pediatrics, geriatrics, and these other uh, specialties. They do get that basic education that they're gonna to need to work as a general care nurse. Uh, but the, they are definitely focusing on people who are gonna be uh, working as trauma nurses. And just thank you for that. Talking about the posters again, there's still some interesting design. There's still there's still lots of glamour, isn't it? I mean, I know you don't want to show someone looking all dowdy and miserable with hasn't brushed her hair because she's been working too many shifts, but there is purely on their design, there's there's a lot you can learn from these posters. There's a lot you can draw about the the, the who has been thinking about this and who they're aiming at it and the artists and you can imagine that the discussions about how they said you know how how dark a shade do we make the lipstick and you know what how much is too much makeup how much is not enough it's a fascinating insight which in, into the, the, the design aspect of it but when we've had other shows about about um women in world war ii it seems to me that lots of the stories we've talked about the soe in britain or the the, the wasp pilots there seems to be some kind of pivotal figure there's like a jimmy doolittle kind of figure behind this are there any kind of unsung nursing heroes within u.s navy nursing or army nursing that are driving things and pushing things and and and, and pushing the boundaries on this or is it a sort of a collective team effort of lots of people For the uh, two main nursing corps, Army and Navy Nursing Corps, they do have a director, um, and the director is uh, guiding uh, kind of policy and things like that. But as far as advancing the role of nurses, um, what we're actually seeing is that the nurses themselves right. are taking on uh, these extra uh, duties and skills, and they're they're stepping up and they're stepping forward with like, hey, I, I need to figure out how to do these sutures because there is no one else here who can do this and it has to happen now. Like that sort of a thing. And that's right. that's fairly, I don't wanna say common, but it's not surprising. Let's put it that way. Like it's not common, but when nurses do it, people are not surprised that this is what they're doing. Um, and the leadership uh, is responding to earlier problems. So the leaders of both the Army and Navy Nurse Corps throughout the war are fighting to get rid of relative rank, to fold the women into the military specifically, get them the proper rank and get them the proper pay for their education level and for what they're doing. Uh, and that, you know, again, that doesn't come around until 1945, 44, 45, when we finally start seeing that sorted out. That's really what the leadership is spending their energy on, fighting with uh, the larger uh, Army and Navy to, to get that squared away. Um, so as far as medical advances and advances in how nurses are perceived and how nursing itself is perceived as a profession, that's being done by the nurses themselves. So it's, it's interesting, depending on kind of, are we talking policy or are we talking kind of social understanding? Uh, yeah, that's, it's a different group doing it in, in each of those cases. I am no, sure that there are answer. women who, I'm sorry, sorry. So it's got a great answer and I, I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying this and, and it's just lovely looking at these images as well. They all are so, so, so brilliant in, in, in what they're showing and, and, and the, the, of their times. But, um, 
we, we are still the, the sense of this week is we are talking about Pearl Harbor. So, you know, mm-hmm. in your research on this and and the, are there any kind of personal heroes or stories of inspiration that, you know, bring you in to, to, to about that give examples of this incredible um, attitude change these women had? Who are kind of your heroines in this in this field or what are the great stories that inspire you? So I don't remember names real well. <laughs> I'm going to preface it with that. But uh, the one, the woman who was walking to shift change uh, when Pearl Harbor happened, um, she was one of those women who uh, had joined it because she wanted adventure. Right. And when she sees it happening and she runs in and then just can't really remember anything that happened, um, she comes back later and continues to work at Pearl. Um at that hospital and can, and she feels that she is supposed to be there. Like serendipity put her there. Uh, there are a couple of women from Manila. Um, Margaret <laughs> is the one that I remember. Margaret was uh, kind of mid range. She was, she wasn't the commander, but she was like middle Middle management, yeah. Yeah, middle management. Um, she was, uh, you know, kind of giving the kind of translating orders from on high down to the nurses who were doing the daily work. And she was the buffer between the Japanese and the women uh, in the camp. Um, and she had been in the hospital on the day of the attack. She had kind of decided that she was going to take care of her nurses. And she did. Uh, she stayed with them when they got evacuated down to Bataan. She stayed with them. Uh, when they went to Corregidor and she spent all of her energy when they were in Corregidor evacuating as many of her nurses as she could. And she got stuck with uh, the stubborn ones who flatly refused to leave their patients. And by the time we get to Corregidor, there's such a limited amount of evacuation space that they are able to kind of say, no, someone else should go and let's send more wounded out. And they were really trying to get other people out uh, before they left. And nurses would leave with a a, a seriously injured patient who needed care on the whole trip. And like, that was the only way that she could convince them to leave. Um, And, and that's a a profound thing. And Margaret's story is the one that really has stayed with me the most. And I first read that, Oh gosh, nearly 15 years ago. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, she, uh, she passed away in the nineties. Still considered kind of, like the den mother, (laughs) if you will, you know, uh, of, of, of these nurses who went through uh, their captivity together and they, they stayed in touch and they stayed friends and, and she was always kind of their leader um, because she had taken so such good care of them. And she didn't, she didn't judge them for uh, either trying to leave or trying to stay. She says, you, you do what you have to do. You do what will help you sleep at night, basically. Yeah. And she kind of yeah. understood that for a lot of these women who were trying to stay, they couldn't leave their patients and live with themselves. And she knew that even in the face of all of this horror, that was something that needed to be respected. All, all, all good stuff. And yeah, and it, it, the, the personal stories are always inspiring in this sense. But kind of to, we'll wrap things up fairly shortly. So, mm-hmm. But in terms of, when I bring people on who've been studying something like this, uh, that's not, that should be more mainstream that isn't. What I mean is, is that your general books about the Pacific theater or your general books about whatever written by middle-aged male historians, do you, uh, they're, they're not really including the stories of the women particularly because obviously there's lots to cram in these books. And it seems to be that there are books about the women often written by female authors, probably largely aimed at a female readership as well, which is great. And that's fantastic. There are books out there. to write, But I think my takeaway when I ha- ever I have someone on talking about the role of women in World War II is it needs to be brought into just World War II as a whole, because World War II was fought by everybody, endured by everybody. Every you know, Bombs don't dis- distinguish between male and female, young and old, black and white, child or adult. And, you know, in your research, do you think... Um, there should be more of the female representation in the general histories of World War II just to give balance. Oh, absolutely. Um, these women were throughout the militaries of all of the Allied powers. They were vital components and vital to the success of the war effort. And to kind of overlook them is to miss a incredibly major part of the story. 
you know, an army, sure, you know, an army has guns and an army has bullets. And how do they get those guns and bullets? There's someone at the quartermaster who is sending them out. And during World War II, that's a woman. Uh, you know, we need to have, as we've been talking about for the last hour, you know, you could half of the care is done by a nurse. You have to have nurses in a hospital in the 1940s. That's how care is done at the time. Um, so if we're not talking about nurses, we're not telling the whole story. And I mean, that's just the women who are in the military. And, and I do understand kind of the impulse to look at Rosie the Riveter and the women in heavy industry because it is so unusual and exciting and it was such a big push at the time. But in my opinion, uh, you can't really truly understand what's happening in World War II uh, if you're not looking at the women who are part of the military effort as well. Yeah. It's, it's a whole thing. I mean, it truly is a total war. Yeah, no, I'm just looking at the questions that get coming in. And one is um, obviously people are asking, could women be drafted? So no, they're all volunteers. That's that's complete. We know that now. The other thing is people are asking about whether there are any monuments to the women who serve. So are there many monuments at Parlour? We've got another question about is there a monument, for example, about the the, uh, the six nurses killed on USS Comfort in the kamikaze attack at Okinawa? In April '45, I'm going to guess there probably isn't a memorial to the women killed because if it's a, if, if if the USA is like the Britain, I think it took till 10 years ago for the women of World War II to get their monument in London, mm -hmm. and they've been 70 years or something without one. It's it, it, we are slow in recognizing the contribution of women unless they're like the spy, secret agent, resistance kind of people that they've had their their all the the test pilot kind of people, but yeah, you know, the nursing, the, the the more the more um. I don't want to say feminine roles, but the more traditional roles for females, I think, have been less less celebrated in terms of World War II. I, I don't maybe my language wasn't the right choice there, but um, it's hard with this. Um, but um, closing thoughts when you're you know the 80th anniversary of Pearl Harbor and you you know when you watch the coverage, there hasn't been much coverage on conventional TV. I was surprised how little I could find on the seventh, but. Um, you know, there should be more female representation. There should be more talking about the nursing. And wh what do you think is the future for our understanding about the female? Well, obviously, you said there's people like yourself, there's people you know who are studying this. Will we be in a better place 10 years uh, from now in understanding the, the vital role women put in, into into winning the winning the war that, that we, we did? Well, I certainly hope so. Um, I do know of uh, several up and coming uh, PhD students who are working on this topic. Uh, and I'm very excited to see what they do. And there are uh, a lot of people who are not just working on women in the military, they're working on gender in the military, right. yeah. which is interesting because now they're also looking at men and how men have gender. And I think if we talk about that more, we can start talking about the women who are involved as well, because once it becomes a thing, unfortunately, once men are part of the conversation, we want to talk about it more when it comes to military history. Um, Real quick, there are no monuments to women uh, killed in World War II. Uh, the one monument that I can think of is for the Vietnam women, uh, yep. we, the nurses of Vietnam by the Vietnam Memorial yep, Wall. Yep, I remember Washington that one. Um, but yeah, 19 army nurses were killed in action uh, in Europe in World War II. And the closest we got was a hospital ship named for one of them, uh, the Francis Slanger. Um, and she was decommissioned in the 50s. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah, uh, and not not that necessarily death or because you know it doesn't sound very many nineteen you know but but then we we did a show about the Alamo Scouts not long ago that Alamo Scouts lose no personnel in combat being killed is no measure of your service it's no measure of of being able to do your job proficiently efficiently and well it's 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 de death is tragic but I think there is an an idea that if you're if you're only contributing to the war effort if you're somehow lots of your people are being killed it's commandos fighter pilots paratroopers that type of thing therefore they're doing more than people who aren't being killed but that's another subject for the day as is gender and i'm reflecting on the fact that the show i did um on stephen Bourne about gay servicemen in british army was the most downvoted show i ever did the most hostile messages i get why are you covering gay men in world war ii blah 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 which just and, and all that does, folks, is make me want to do more of it. So they have the reverse effect on me, that idea. But that's another aspect. We could go down mm -hmm. that whole thing. We could talk about the relationships between nurses mm -hmm. and, and, say, and and servicemen. And, and we could talk about marriages and, and pregnancies. There's a whole lot more stuff we could talk about with this. Mm -hmm. But 
In terms of the nurses at Pearl Harbor, any kind of last closing remarks you think about that the audience should know about about that day and what those people did there, and indeed in Manila, any kind of final closing thoughts? I think that I want people to remember that they were there yeah. and that they had been there and that they were doing their jobs every day, much as all of the men were doing and that they were part of the military contingent. And when the attacks happened, just like the men, they did their job. Yeah. And just like the men, some of them stepped up in heroic ways and went above and beyond. And their stories are just like the men's and to say otherwise is, is a disservice not only to them, but to the men that they served and th that they cared for. And I think that uh, it's important to remember kind of what is involved in military medicine. Uh, we do tend to think it's, it's all men because the military is all men, but it's not. And neither is the military. But I think that uh, it's important to keep that in mind that, that military medicine has for decades before Pearl Harbor had been uh, integrated gender wise. Yeah. And I think that that's uh, important to remember that those women were there and they were just as heroic as the men uh, just in different ways and with less explosions. Yeah. And, and, it, and we all look forward. Well, I do look forward to the day when women's history in World War II won't be a separate shelf. It'll just be all part of the, the same big shelf. And it'll be, we'll be talking about medicine at, I mean, at Pearl Harbor or, 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 medical core response to and not necessarily have to kind of talk about it in a separate way but that's where we, we are where we are now and that's the way we're pushing things forward but it is yeah that the, the scope of the the world war ii was won by everybody from all walks of life and all colors and ages and, and backgrounds and genders and 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 politics and and that's that's the way to look at it but um we'll bring things to an end um i i will have you back on at some point in the future because i would love to just do a show about recruiting generally of, of women and the posters and the art behind it that would be fantastic but um right now i'm just gonna remind people what we are coming up in a minute i'll come back and say goodbye in a second so folks Pearl Harbor Week continues tomorrow with Colonel U.S. Marine Corps retired Charles Jones, who's going to come on and talk about the Medal of Honor recipients at Pearl Harbor. So uh, just a catalog of stories of bravery, followed by more bravery, followed by sacrifice, and a couple of bits of comments of Charles's research about people that received medals and, and, and the, the, how it worked and why they were, some are written up when they were and what happened. It'll be a fantastic show. I'm looking forward to that. And then Saturday, of course, Craig Simons is coming on and talking about the Battle of Coral Sea. And then Battle of the Bold, three weeks starts. So as usual, folks, don't forget to share what we're doing on social media. Please consider becoming a patron or if not, join the YouTube channel membership details in the description below. Um, share what we're doing. Tweet everything bring people into World War II TV because the caliber of guests deserves a bigger audience. Although I'm very happy with you people we have, and I'm very grateful you contribute with your comments there, but please consider about bringing us some more people because we think we deserve it. Right. But right now it just remains me to say, thank you very much Dr. Bisbee for joining us. And will you be happy to come back and talk about recruiting generally at some point in the future? He said, putting her on the spot says she has to say yes. Absolutely. I would love to spend just an hour yelling about recruiting. <laughs> that would be brilliant. We could do that. It would be fantastic. So, well, there we are then. This is Paul Woodard for World War II TV saying I'll see you all tomorrow when we talk about the Medal of Honor recipients from Pearl Harbor. Thanks, everybody, for your attention today. Have a good rest of your uh, uh, um, Wednesday. I forgot what day of the week it was then. Have a good Wednesday. Cheers, everybody. Bye. <laughs>